Well, hello. Cat and dogs on wheels here. I'm Cat. This is RJ if you're new. But for most of you, this is an update. It's been quite the eventful year. It was my first year on the road officially. The first of November, I'd been on the road for a year. I also spent that year fighting cancer. And my last treatment was December 1st. So yeah, it's been a very busy year, but it's been a good year. It's been a painful year. It's been an uplifting year. It's been a year filled with love. Um, I did the whole cancer battle in my bus with my trusty dog. And my dear, dear friends and my sister and moral support from so many, including you viewers. And then there's the GoFundMe. I don't know what I would have done without it. Mary and my sister Christina decided it was a necessity. And I have to say it was overwhelming the response that we got, the family, friends, viewers, and people I didn't even know. The fact that people cared was so heartwarming. And it saved my butt. It really did. When I did surgeries, there was time I'm commuting to do surgery, so we would go and spend a night in the hotel and the fuel expense, I didn't have to worry about any of that. It was there. The um, supplemental payments that I had to make, um, Medicaid would only cover me in the county of my home address, which is Tucson, but it was way too hot down there and I needed to be up in Kingman and Flagstaff and then Phoenix. So I didn't use my Medicaid, I used my Medicare and there was supplemental payments involved with that. So I just can't say thank you enough. Um, all I could do is put my head down and get through the treatments. And I don't know what I would have done if finances would have been an issue also, like, am I gonna make it to that appointment because we don't have fuel? Um, and before surgery wasn't bad, but after surgery, driving was very uncomfortable. I mean, and I wasn't driving, but just riding was very uncomfortable. So I needed that day of reprieve. Anyway, I just have to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We were able to stay in temperate weather. We didn't have to fight the high temperatures. We just kept moving as we needed to. And made the whole route down up through Lake Havasu to Kingman to Williams to Flagstaff and a couple of trips down to Phoenix and then I plus I ended up the tail end of my treatment was in Phoenix but it was after the temperatures had cooled so we stayed in moderate temperatures the whole time I was blessed with incredible doctors and they understood that I was living in the bus with my dog and that the temperatures outside were important and they transferred me to the right people in the right temperature climates and I made it through but it wasn't easy and I have lots to tell you about. Pam and Mary you're going to hear a lot about. My sister has played a big role, my sister Christina, Chrissy as I call her, big role. And then not just the on hands people, but all the love and outpouring that I got from just friends, my viewer slash friends, um, your love and concern and prayers. Oh my God, all that helped me through everything. That. I couldn't have done it without everything. We had a common saying that took hold around here that people were on Team Cat. Well, 
Team Cat got me through this. I couldn't have done it without them. And I couldn't have done it without doctors and techs and nurses and all the people that were taking care of me. I felt secure, like they cared. I felt safe. So it enabled me to do things I didn't think I was gonna be able to do. Cervical cancer. It can totally be avoided, at least the most common cause of it, which is a virus. And I have to take responsibility for causing my own cancer. This could have totally been avoided. I wouldn't have had to go through any of this if I had just gotten my pap smears on a regular basis. Um, I have, okay, my male doctor was my first um, gynecologist. And when he asked me how long it had been since I had a pap smear, and I had to say probably back in 1975 when I had my son, he didn't like shocked, horrified, no shaming, none of that. He just told me, this is what I want to ask of you. He goes, I need you to be a witness. I need you to go out there and tell everyone you know how important the pap smears are. He didn't shame me. Um, he just wanted me to be a witness, and that's what I'm going to be here doing. you got to have your pap smears. You could avoid everything that I went through. The thing is, is I had a, <clears throat> a bleeding tumor. So like when they did the scope, when they put the scope up me to do in, uh, imaging, it made me bleed. Whenever they did anything, they couldn't even really give me a pap smear because when they just first started and first start, I started hemorrhaging all over the place. So... They couldn't get it. He was looking for a biopsy and he couldn't, they, he couldn't do a biopsy. He did the surgery for the biopsy, but it made me hemorrhage all over the place again. You have the virus for years and it turns cells abnormal and turns them into cancer cells. Well, I had a really big tumor. The doctor said it had been growing for many years. Okay. So this is something that, but it, I didn't notice it until it got so big that it was painful and then it was starting to bleed. So they sent me down to an oncologist in Phoenix and she determined that I did have cancer and that I needed to start chemo and radiation. Now, I always said that if I got cancer, I wasn't doing chemo. I wasn't doing radiation. I felt like I would watch too many people suffer, go through hell, and die. And I just knew I didn't have the strength to make myself go through <clears throat> what my mother went through. But Dr. Wingo, she informed me that all cancers are different and they have different chemo treatments and she said that this is nothing like what they were doing for my mom for ovarian cancer I asked I go isn't there alternatives now to chemo I mean I've heard of the vitamin C therapy and the immunotherapy I go aren't people kicking it with that stuff and she said not for this type of cancer she said cervical cancer those things aren't gonna work she said We've been treating it this way now for many years. We've got the formula down. It's a very successful treatment. This is what you have to do. And so Mary and Pam informed me, this is what I have to do. My sister informed me, this is what I have to do. I did a lot of praying. I asked for prayers. My prayers were all just for the strength to get through this, the strength, the lack of fear, I needed my anxiety, I needed the strength to do this. It was too hot in Phoenix to do it in Phoenix, so Dr. Wingo transferred me up to Flagstaff where it was cooler and I had a chemo doctor and a radiation doctor. <clears throat> well, the first time I went in to do chemo, I basically had a panic attack and I couldn't go in. Once I saw, once I walked up and looked through the door and saw the people on chemo 
and I just felt like I can't do this. And I just told Mary was with me and I told her, I can't do this. And I started crying and wanted to turn around and just leave. And she just put her arm around me very firmly and said, we're doing this. And she walked me into the chemo room. And I made it through. The chemo wasn't easy, but it was doable. They did, you know, one doctor, Dr. Wingo said I wouldn't lose my hair. Dr. Conlon said, she said, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> well, I didn't lose my hair. Either Mary or my sister Christina was taking me to all my chemo and radiation treatments. We sort of, Mary had an emergency situation. So Pam and I cut her loose a week early. My sister had just come down for two weeks. So Pam took me on my last week of treatments. Pam was the one taking care of RG, taking him on walks, feeding him for me, cleaning my bus, refilling my waters, doing my shopping, do, doing all of my chores. I basically had gone, woo, basically flat, full care. Okay, I finished my, what they called external radiation and my chemo. Now I had to go down to Phoenix to do internal radiation, five weeks of internal radiation. I was worried. Internal radiation, they take these needles and they put them up you and they insert, they inserted three needles directly into my bleeding tumor. And then you have to wait for a half an hour while they program everything in. They, they basically first they, run you through a thing to take pictures and then they stick the probes in and then you wait for 30 minutes while they program everything into the computer and then they wheel you into another room and they connect your three needles into the radiation thing and then you lay there for half an hour and get radiated that way. Now, barbaric. It, I, my first treatment was so horrific that I knew there's no way I was doing it again. I was, it was like he was shoving fire pokers up me and sticking them in and that fire and that pain stayed with me the whole time. So for once they stick them in, you've got about an hour, an hour and a half before they take them out. And I was in pain and I felt so vulnerable and so afraid. And it was like they stuck the needles in, then they wheel me into a room to wait. And then they come and wheel me into another one, connect me, and then you're alone again. And you're vulnerable. You're laying there. Your legs are spread. You got needle, hot fire poker needles up and there's nothing you can do about it. It's not like you can get up and walk away. It was the worst experience of my life. And I knew when I was going through that, it was like, I'm never doing this again. This is, I could not even imagine voluntarily going in there and going through that torture again. I had planned, I had told them I wanted to ask the doctor some questions after the treatment, but that's before I went through the treatment. And they were saying, now doctor will meet you. And I go, no, 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 I just want to leave. I'm just leaving. No, 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 no questions, nothing. I'm out of here. I was weeping. I was crying. I mean, cried to the point of the snotty nose. And Mary was waiting in the waiting room and she thought we were going in to see the doctor. And I just said, no, we're getting out of here now. I go, no, no, I can't do it. We're out of here. I sat on the curb and cried and told Mary, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I can't do this again. This was the worst. I can't do it. Everything, I thought everything else was hard enough, but this, there's no way. I'm telling you, it was the worst torture I'd ever gone through. Now, Mary and Pam are freaking out because I come back, I'm crying. And I'm telling them, I, I'm now I'm, 
I just said, no, I'm not going. I'm not going. I can't do it. And I cried. I just came in the bus and cried. Mary. And of course, they're they're freaking out. They're, and I they called my, they had called my sister. She's freaking out. Um, my sister wanted me to get a new doctor. <laughs> but I thought they were not caring. I thought they didn't tell me anything that was going on. But you know what? That was all miscommunication. I don't know if I've told you. I'm really hard of hearing right now. And I... Have, I have to tell people that so they don't think I'm being a snob. So they were communicating with me, but now if I if someone is talking to me and looking at me, it's easier. But if they turn their head at all or their back to me, if I can't see them talking, I can't hear. I mean, I can hear there's a conversation, but I can't differentiate words or anything. So as it turns out, they did explain the procedure to me, but. I didn't hear it. So I just felt like they were doing their thing and leaving me, doing their thing and leaving me and not telling me anything that's going on. The other thing, there was a mix up in communication with the meds I was supposed to take before the treatment. Now, at the time I was taking a dose of morphine in the morning and a dose of morphine at night. And I'd been taking oxycodone for the pain. For the other, the morphine was like a general overall habit in it. But anyway, so I was doing the oxycodone. Well, I was out of the oxycodone, but I hadn't worried about it because I wasn't in horrible pain towards in between Flagstaff and Phoenix. But the pain, I, they had done a prescription. They told me, we're, we're, go pick up your prescription and take those pills be, an hour before you come in. Well, they didn't have, they, I had the oxycodone, but that was the only thing. So I thought that's all I needed to take. But they also wanted me to double up on my anxiety pill. And those also, I think the anti-anxiety, I don't know, maybe it puts your brain somewhere else. But they were in shock that I hadn't taken any anti-anxiety pills. Mary talked to them. She called the doctor and I didn't want her to call the doctor because I was afraid if she complained to the doctor that then he would be even less nice to me if I went back in. And so I thought, you know, no, 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 don't, don't call him. And she said, no, she, she need, Mary just took charge. And she called the doctor and talked to the doctor. Now, Mary and my sister both have permission to get into any of my medical records, have any questions answered by the doctors and, and ask any questions of the doctors. So Mary called them up and talked to them. And there was definitely, they had no idea that I hadn't heard the instructions. They had no idea that I, and they, so they said, okay, we got to, it's not going to be as bad next time. They kept promising me and it's not going to be as bad. Also, they used the smallest probes to stick up me that they had in, in supply. But once they had stuck those up me and I'm freaking out and crying and tell them, no, this hurts so bad. He said that he will order smaller probes. He goes, you're just so tiny. The probes are too big. So that also had something to do, I think, with the extreme agony that I was in. So... Cause, and what Mary did is she called my, she goes, look, we've got to do something different. She will not come in there. She wants to quit treatment. She won't come in there if it's the same. She go, So Mary said, you have to help us. We have to figure out a way to do this so that she is not in such horrific, torturous pain when it's happening. Well, for one, I felt like my oxycodone didn't really kick in. Um in time. I don't think my oxycodone, I mean, I didn't feel like I had any kind of pain meds in me when that happened. So for the next treatment, I took my pills an hour and a half before. So I was actually loopy before I walked through the doors. Uh, before I felt totally straight when I walked through the doors. 
So I had my morphine. I took two oxycodones, which he had upped the strength of them for me. So I took two of those and I took two of my anti-anxiety pills, but I also had, I had two kinds of anxiety pills. So I took two of the ones that I can take multiple times a day. And I took the one that I'm just supposed to take in the morning and evening. So I had much more medication in me. In fact, by the time I was walking in there, an hour and a half is a better time than an hour. The medication hadn't kicked in enough in an hour. So I was pretty loopy when I went in and I had all my anti-anxiety medication. So I wasn't really too afraid and everybody promised me it wasn't going to be the same as the last time. And thank God it wasn't. Woohoo! Last treatment. Last treatment. And he said everything is looking good. People are talking success. How do you feel? I feel so good. I feel so free. I'm starting to feel normal again. But when you get your meds right, it's really virtually painless. And I was afraid it was going to be horrible. It was painless. Yay. And now I'm free three months. And you're buzzed. Hmm? And you're buzzed. And oh yes, I am very buzzed. These are that's maybe one of the fun things is by the time you come out, you're a little loopy. It's fun. And now I'm starving and I'm ready to eat something. So let's go eat. Let's go eat. We're right back in quartzite. I'm recovering really well. If any of you viewers or friends out there are anywhere in the quartzite area, uh, you know, go ahead and if you want to get together, meet up, do a little camping, whatever, <laughs> um, email me at catanddogsonwheels at gmail.com and uh, we can make plans.